body of Christ, his ecclesial presence is more intense and more important than that in the consecrated elements. The error in this logic can be exposed if one thinks of the Incarnation. Jesus became man and died on the cross for the sake of our redemption, but it does not follow that God is more intensely present in the community of the redeemed than in the incarnate Son, or that our devotion should focus more on our fellow Christians than on Christ the Lord. A second argument sometimes used to exalt the church over the Eucharist is that the church as a general sacrament produces the seven special sacraments, including the Eucharist, which are actions of the church. The church, it is said, cannot give what she does not have. But this argument overlooks the fact that the church does not produce the sacraments by her own power. The Eucharist, like other sacraments, is God's gift. In producing it, the church is subordinate to Christ, the principal minister. The church, moreover, is built up by the Eucharist. The faithful are one body because they partake of the one bread, which is Christ the Lord. And so we can truly say, as Pope John Paul II does in his encyclical, that if the Church makes the Eucharist, it is no less true that the Eucharist makes the Church. A third line of thinking that tends to minimize the reality of Christ's presence in the Eucharist comes from personalist phenomenology that was very much in fashion around the time of the Second Vatican Council. Concentrating as it does on interpersonal relations, this school of thought equates personal existence with human relationships. Theologians of this tendency rejected the idea of substance, especially as applied to the Eucharist, which they treated as a communal meal. Even on the natural level, they said, a meal with friends is much more than food and drink. It is a social occasion for expressing and cementing human relationships. And so too, they said, with the Eucharist, in inviting us to his supper, the Lord gives uh, the bread and wine a new meaning and a new purpose as effective symbols of his redemptive love, bringing the community together. The elements are changed insofar as they acquire new significance and a new finality. For this reason, they maintained, we should speak of transsignification and transfinalization rather than transubstantiation. These novel terms are ugly and cumbersome and thus, rhetorically, no improvement on transubstantiation. But in what they positively express, the terms are harmless. In the Eucharist, the significance and purpose of the bread and wine are indeed changed. They indicate and bring about spiritual nourishment and joyful communion with Christ and our fellow Christians but the alternative terminology is deficient because it tells us nothing about what happens to the consecrated elements in themselves. Paul VI in his encyclical, The Mystery of Faith, pointed out that the bread and wine are able to take on a radically new significance and finality because they contain a new reality. The change of meaning and purpose depend upon a prior ontological change. We can relate personally to Christ in the sacrament and he to us because he's really there. His presence in the sacrament is real and personal whether or not anyone believes or perceives it. The Eucharist is not just a sign 
but a person who subsists in his own right as persons do. A Dutch theologian of the 1960s put the question whether the real presence would remain in the consecrated hosts if everyone in the world were suddenly killed by some extraordinary disaster. He answered his question in the negative on the ground that personal presence cannot exist except in a mutual encounter between free and conscious subjects. This theologian seems to confuse two meanings of presence. It can mean either of two things. It can be presence in, as a soul is present in the body, or as Christ is present in the Eucharistic elements. Or it can mean presence to others. Of the two, presence in is the more fundamental. To reduce the real presence to the latter is reductionist. It departs from the faith of the Catholic Church, which holds that Christ's real presence in the Eucharist is objective and independent of anyone's perception of it. Questions continue to be raised about the term substance, mainly because the classical concept of substance common to realist thought is not widely accepted today. Since the time of Descartes and Locke, the term has come to stand for something self-enclosed and inert, whereas formerly it meant an active relation-generating center which, through its accidents, entered into dynamic relations with other creatures. Understandably, today, many people find it strange to call a person a substance. But if the classical concept is abandoned, some other term must be found to designate what a thing is in its own fundamental reality. In calling the Eucharistic presence of Christ substantial, the Church means that the Eucharist in its own reality is nothing other than Christ. Transubstantiation, as I have explained, is the process by which one substance, that of the bread or wine, becomes another, that of Christ's body and blood, without any change in the physico-chemical aspects. Trent taught that the term was very apt. Paul VI, in 1965, said that it was still fitting and accurate, and, as I have mentioned, called it superior to other terms that had been proposed. But the Church is not definitively wedded to any particular vocabulary. A change in the terminology remains theoretically possible. Partly as a result of the new Eucharistic theologies proposed during and shortly after Vatican II, there was a temporary loss of interest in the reserved sacrament. All attention seemed to be focused on the actual celebration of Mass. In many parishes and religious houses, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament was suddenly abandoned. In some churches, the Blessed Sacrament was reserved